four university students sharing a house seems like it would provide fertile ground for a situation comedy. But it hadn't even been attempted until a revolution in British comedy took place in the early 80s. Ugh, it was punk rock, right on, satirical, silly, violent, scatological. And from that movement came one of the most influential and beloved British comedies of the 1980s. Have we got a video? The Young Ones. Yes, we've got a video! In the 1970s in Britain, there were two types of comedians. Rough regional comics in working man's clubs telling sexist and racist jokes about their mother-in-law, or middle-class Oxbridge types telling sexist and racist jokes about their mother-in-law, but with perfect diction. And then in the late 70s, a new breed of performers started appearing in the then-new phenomenon of the comedy club, with many performers drawn from fringe theatre and red brick universities. This is actually very serious. <laughs> BBC producer Paul Jackson put together a special featuring some of the rising stars of the alternative comedy scene, Boom Boom Out Go The Lights, featuring Rick Mayall and Nigel Planer in separate solo acts as early versions of Rick and Neil respectively. That was really pretty bad, Rick. <laughs> bad for society when the kids start to get into it. Mayall and co-writer Lise Mayer pitched to Jackson an idea about students sharing a house and brought in fellow Manchester University alumnus Ben Elton to co-write a pilot, which was recorded, then sat on the shelf for nearly a year before the BBC was spurred into action by seeing most of the Young Ones cast promoted as appearing on new rival Channel 4 in a series of short films called The Comic Strip Presents, starting with Five Go Mad in Dorset. Mm, my favourite, ham and turkey sandwiches, heaps of tomatoes, fresh lettuce and lashings of ginger beer. Mayel, Mayer and Elton were quickly commissioned by the BBC to write five more scripts to make up, along with the pilot, the first series of the Young Ones. Sociology student Rick thought of himself as the people's poet and an anarchist. Pollution, are you coming to my town? But he's also a cowardly hypocrite. I've never seen that dress before in my life! Well, it's got your name tag in it, Rick! He hates Thatcher's Britons. I am your satisfied Thatcher! While occasionally admiring parts of it. Workshine layabouts, all wandering around, clutching their gyros, trying to get something for nothing. Rick is insufferably self-important, overly dramatic, the only child of middle-class parents. Rick, your parents died this morning. And about as charming as dandruff. Rick, 15 credibility street. <laughs> that, that's, that's Rick. Rick. Oh, forget it. Put me on. Yes, put me on. He's also a fan of Cliff Richard. When Cliff Richard wrote Wired for Sound, no way was he sitting on a clean lavatory. And alternates between being a pushy bully and a fawning creep. If anyone gets their comeuppance in a Young Ones episode, it will be Rick. And likely multiple times. Ha <laughs> ha! Missed both my legs! He's that person in your social circle that you still can't work out why you are friends with this person. In that case, why isn't Cliff Richard boring clever trousers? <laughs> Tell me that! He's obnoxious to a fault. Ooh, uh, he is a bastard, isn't he? A trait he feels is justified by his political activism. Neil, are these lentils South African? Rick Mayall had made a career of playing thoroughly unpleasant types to the point where Rick wasn't even the worst he had created. The, the pigs? Bastards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the few bad apples that spoil their otherwise spotless image. Mike, the cool person, is the leader of the group. Mike is too cool for school. Then he and the Dean might have to seriously reconsider your grant. Oh, well, you can tell Mike too that I've still got the photographs of him and the Dean. Has a way with the ladies, or so he thinks. He's a spiv, a wide boy, and a con man. Wise up, Rick. Look, this world is like a burnt steak. Small, tough, and the chips are always stacked against it. Mike's prime mode of speech is a constant stream of metaphors and non sequiturs. Well, if you're going to sin, you might as well be original. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know. Mike spins the most elaborate web of bullshit of the four housemates. Here we are, baby. Ready for action, ready for fun, ready for loving, and it's only just gone one. Gosh, is that the time? No, time is an abstract concept. That's a wristwatch. Unlike the others, Christopher Ryan was an actor rather than a comedian. The role was originally meant to be taken by Peter Richardson, who was the driving force behind the Comic Strip Presents films, but he was unavailable, reportedly due to a disagreement with Paul Jackson, and subsequently Christopher Ryan was brought in and made the role his own. Call an ambulance. Why, Mike? 
I've just nailed my legs to the table. Neil was a leftover flower power style hippie. I won't say anything because no one ever listens to me anyway. <laughs> might as well be a Leonard Cohen record. He was preparing lentil dishes before lentil dishes were fashionable and wearing flared trousers when they had become instantly unfashionable when the clocks ticked over to 1980. Don't you dare say that! Flares are coming back in! Neil is stuck in the age of Aquarius, a holdover from the early 70s, and despite keeping his housemates fed, he's totally unappreciated by them. It's as if the kettle's killed itself rather than be used by me. And is a constant target of abuse, particularly from Rick. Hippie. And Vivian. Smelly. And Mike. What's ugly, smelly and boring and is standing in front of me called Neil? And, well, everyone. You all really hate me, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we do, Neil. <laughs> Close, Neil. Vivian was the punk medical student whose violent tendencies gave the series so many iconic moments of ultra-violence. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I just don't seem to be able to get rid of this hangover. Vivian is a nihilist and a thrill-seeker, out for his own gratification, living in the now with no regards for the consequences of his actions. <laughs> Makes me lose my usual tolerant and easygoing approach to communal living. <laughs> Viv owns a yellow Ford Anglia with flames on the side and has a pet hamster, SPG, short for Special Patrol Group. I think Special Patrol Group is a stupid name for a hamster. <laughs> OK, I'll change it then. Hello, Cliff Richard. <laughs> Vivian is the source of much of the trademark slapstick humour in the show. A force of nature demolishing walls, windows, cups, bricks, and anything else going. <laughs> Even mindless violence seems boring today. Viv's internal logic is consistently dangerous, like a time bomb really impatient to just get on with the business of exploding. <laughs> Vivian, you can't do acupuncture with six inch nails. <laughs> a fifth regular character takes a little more time to explain. Listen, don't you think it's a nice house here? It's good house, it's clean house, Michael Caine and Twiggy, yes. I'm not really foreign, you know. I just do it to appear more sophisticated. Alexi Sale had made his bones as the MC at the Comedy Store in London with his violent and intimidating manner, and he brought his act to the show in a unique way. In most episodes, he would come in for one scene, performing a few minutes of stand-up that often had little relation to the rest of the episode. And they all talk about me behind me back. I hate him. He drinks like a fish. Really? He's got no talent. Alexi who? He would play a different character each episode, either as landlord Jersey Bolovsky or a different member of his family. All you get from a public school, right? One, you get a top job, right? And two, you get an interest in perverse sexual practices. Some of his monologues are fantastic and others less so. It really does depend on the episode. I want you to pay attention because we'll be back after this break. Oh! <laughs> Transported for life to the colonies. And for what? It's for my accent and my situation that I am condemned. And for all their murders you've done. The young ones started with an up-tempo version of an old Cliff Richard song and introduced four very different housemates who weren't friends or even civil with each other. Anarchic is a word often used to describe the young ones, but if you were comparing it to other British sitcoms of 1982, you would see just how very different it was. Okay! too loud and it's violent so very very violent but it's cartoon violence like Tom and Jerry Vivian loses a finger in one episode and his head in another and Neil is killed by Rick and everything's back to normal by the next scene while the young ones is nominally a sitcom telling a story with a beginning a middle poo jokes and an end it's also littered with jokes breaking the fourth wall Vivian why do you keep telling us what's just about to happen next because it's a studio set, Michael, and they can't afford any long shots, you see. Or we'll cut to an aside featuring puppets commenting on the episode. It's a bloody game, any day. What is chess? Or punctuating the action with short sketches that often have little or nothing to do with the rest of the show, often featuring the cast's comedy contemporaries. <laughs> and then there are the musical acts. 
Music! Each episode would have a band show up and sing a song, with the episode usually grinding to a halt for a few minutes, while some group you'll likely never hear from again sings their minor hit. Obvious exceptions to this rule are Madness appearing, or Dexy's Midnight Runners, or best of all, Motorhead singing Ace of Spades in the Living Room. Part of the reasoning behind this was that producer Paul Jackson wanted to get the show made by the BBC's light entertainment department rather than the comedy department, since as a variety show with sketches and a musical act, it would get a bigger budget and two days in the studio rather than the one day they would have gotten as a sitcom. I said something about the Pope. It's a bit stupid, you know, she's Catholic. Yeah, I know she's Catholic, I didn't know the Pope was. Even with all the asides and interludes, there is still a story in each episode, even though quite a few episodes just end with a simple shrug of the shoulders. Goodness, is that the time? <laughs> BBC comedies of the time were generally not set in grotty houses caked with debris and filth and let's be honest, all manner of bodily fluids and excretia. This level of squalor was familiar to people who lived in share houses and squats during their student days. Though not me, I lived in a floating castle in the sky next to James Cameron, but you know, other people. Do you think you could get something while you're there to clean the toilet with? <laughs> what? <laughs> you can't clean the toilet, Neil! It'll lose all its character! The house featured in most episodes was the same, but camera angles changed episode to episode to accommodate the action. Apart from the pilot, the exteriors of the house and surrounds were filmed in Bristol rather than London, where the studio sessions took place and, of course, where the series was set. Oh, excuse me, did you throw that? Yeah, good shot, wasn't it? The first season began with the housemates about to be cast out of their house when it was marked for demolition by the council. If we don't smash the house up, the council are going to demolish it tomorrow! Each housemate has a conflicting plan for dealing with their impending eviction. Rick plans a protest. There's no way you can hammer in the last nail. Mike intends to sweet talk the council representative. Viv is going to demolish the house. And Neil is going to try and G up everyone's spirits by making lentils and killing himself. Wow, I really hope we don't have a crash. The new house doesn't fare any better, with the discovery of oil in the basement leading to a brutal dictatorship. That's OK now. It was bound to happen sooner or later. A day with nothing much going on has the housemates missing a lot of weird goings on around them. What's happening to us? We never used to be like this. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, he's right, Rick. We've always been like this. I'm going to form a new union society, right? With me as president. People who don't pay their TV licenses against the Nazis! An atom bomb in the kitchen has Mike trying to sell it on the black market. Viv trying to set it off himself. Rick wants to blackmail the government. And Neil builds a bomb shelter under the kitchen table. The old trick, eh? Eat the telly before I get a chance to nick you. <laughs> It's a toaster. A house party gives us the rare chance to see the housemate's friends. It's a telescope! <laughs> a telescope with a mouse in it! Millions! And a flood combined with Vivian's formula that turns you into a homicidal maniac leads to some hairy moments. I just bet a bit later on somebody does drink that and turns into an axe-wielding homicidal maniac. Have some Turkish delights. <laughs> the first season rated OK for a BBC Two comedy, but repeat screenings brought in more viewers, with the Young Ones cult forming. There were the people who had seen the Young Ones and the people who hadn't. Anyway, I'm not going to the laundrette, I'm going to the cellar. I've got a stiff. Know what I mean? You either understood the Young Ones or you didn't. And even on its original broadcast, the Young Ones did have a very large audience of young teens and pre-teens, as well as the older student types. Five pounds to get into my own bedroom? Ha! What have you done? Turn it into a viola disco? Uncanny. The call for more episodes did not go unheard, and a second series of six episodes would follow in 1984. Darling fascist bully boy, give me some more money, you bastard. May the seed of your loin be fruitful in the belly of your woman. Though, the show would also end with the 12th episode. If 12 episodes was enough for John Cleese and Faulty Towers, it would be enough for the young ones. Which doesn't explain why New Statesman and Bottom ran for so long. These six episodes are just as anarchic, but with a slightly more polished production. You do the cooking, I'll look after the plants and the goldfish. Yeah. 
And what did you make me cook on that first day? Sausages and plants and goldfish! The group heads to the laundrette before Neil remembers they're supposed to represent their school, Scumbag College, on University Challenge, up against the posh kids of Footlights College, Oxbridge. Scumbag Neil. Uh, can I go to the toilet? <laughs> Who is the richest person in the world? Footlights snot. It's, it's me, isn't it? The lads are broke and reduced to burning all of Rick's possessions to stay warm. I'm going to have a baby! And it's up to Neil to get the only job he can find, joining the police. Listen it. <laughs> right, listen. Oh, no. Nasty sees the flatmates borrowing a video cassette recorder for the night in order to watch a video nasty, which for normal people not living in 1980s tabloids is a horror movie. <laughs> We can't bury Rick alive. That's absolutely correct, Neil. We'd better kill him first. A South African vampire who only preys on virgins forces a tough decision on the lads. We've all got to lose our virginity. Now, that's not Rick. That's not Viv. <laughs> Bag's not Neil. Time begins with a wicked parody of Dallas. In the one day since you inherited global oil, you've managed to dispose of assets worth over six billion dollars. <laughs> The morning after a student party, Rick awakes to find a woman in his bed. Well, it just goes to show you, Neil. Even when I'm unconscious, I can pick up the birds. I mean, forge meaningful relationships with birds. Uh, chicks, task, but women, women. Who turns out to be a murderess rather than Rick's one night stand. Rick is still a virgin! I'm not! I'm not, I'm not a virgin! Viv and Rick trade barbs until they all realize. It seems as though mysteriously, the whole house has gone through some sort of time warp. Sick starts off with the lads all feeling ill. Now I live on the limit, Vivian, the limit. Because I'm a writer at the gates of dawn and I take no prisoners. A massive riot breaks out. What a ghastly smell. Yeah, uh, that's Vivian, Mummy. Fascinating. <laughs> I think I'd better be sick. And somehow ends with a piss take of The Good Life. Just thought you might need it to cover up that dead hippie you just murdered. That's yeah. <laughs> Summer holiday starts just after the end of term. Bored, 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 bored. Things quickly go from bad to worse, with their landlord evicting them. And look at me now! Homeless, cold and prostitute! <laughs> Destitute, Rick. Oh, glory be and save us, Mike! Do we have to mince with birds? Mike Channel's gone with the wind. I know all about dirt. When I was a kid, I had to eat it. And I'm never going back, you hear me? What? I said, I'm never going back. And a plan to rob a bank takes an unexpected turn. <laughs> right, has everybody got their alibis? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Vivian? It was Rick! <laughs> it was Rick. Rick. It was me. What's your alibi, Mike? I don't need one, Neil. I'm the guy who phones the police. Also, spoilers, their escape echoes Cliff Richard's 50s movie, Summer Holiday. Because we're young ones, bachelor boys, crazy, mad, wild-eyed, big-bottomed anarchists. <laughs> Look out! Cliff! <laughs> But this season and the ending did not see interest in the show fade for several years. There were books and spin-off singles, including the 1986 charity single with Cliff Richard of his 50s hit Living Doll. You know, it is amazing what you can come up with with just flour and water. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> glue. Planer, Edmondson and Mayall all worked together in various combinations in the comic strip presents films and together on the, well, we'll call it a spiritual successor, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, which, honestly, don't bother. In fact, I don't think of anything nicer than having you all stroking me pussy. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, love, don't milk it. That's the third time you've done that gag. And he used to do it in every ad of that appalling sitcom you used to do. <laughs> and, of course, Edmondson and Mayall built on their old day jacked with their 90s cult series, Bottom. No one tells me what time to go to bed! Go to bed, spotty. Twelve episodes makes it hard to keep up interest in something forever. I revisit the show every now and then. Then when I really think about it, it ends up being a decade between rewatches. My enjoyment level is different each time, but I still have my favourite episodes. Interesting. It's not supposed to start for another five minutes. I just think you remember telling you 7.30. Are you calling me a liar? I went to see the careers officer in Big College yesterday, and he said that all he got left was chairman of British Rail. <laughs> well, I wanted to be director general of the BBC. Andy with its never-ending cavalcade of famous faces. What is the record number of marshmallows stuffed up one nostril? Scumbag Mike. Uh, 604, Toxtus O'Grady, USA. I told you that, Mike, you bloody cheat! Time and summer holiday. <laughs> oh, 
no! I never knew I wore a wig! Years later, an eagle eye viewer noted that there's this unknown person sitting quietly in the corner in some episodes. Don't you realise the way you act is influencing millions of children to talk cockney and be insubordinate? Oh, come on, sir, don't be silly. We're the only kids in Britain who never say... The young ones drew from a vast array of performers, old and new, with some of the more memorable faces being series co-writer Ben Elton in many roles, Dawn French, Jennifer Saunders, Hale and Pace, Robbie Coltrane, Mel Smith, Griff Rhys-Jones, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, Emma Thompson, Terry Jones, and, you know, such was the talent involved in this show, even two of the guest stars later became Knights of the Realm, Sir Lenny Henry and Sir Tony Robinson. All right, but verbatim regurgitations against my principles. I'm asking you to test me on it, not throw up on it. <laughs> Over the years, the young ones looked charmingly dated, then offensively dated, then just boringly dated. This is a, this is a pub, they don't do coffee. And now it feels fresh again. Sometimes I get those headachey pains. She's talking about period pains. <laughs> like a dirty cloth nappy that's been marinating in nappy sand for a week. <laughs> ah, Neil, how do you give me that black water? <laughs> Some of the topical references may mean little to people who weren't there, and others will just seem quaint. But for many people of a certain age, The Young Ones is a defining show of the 1980s. It's almost a cartoon, but it's still relatable for many people, eminently quotable, and definitely a time capsule of the time in which it was made. Where were we? <laughs> oh, yes! Virgin! Yeah. Ah, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.